This week we're considering the problem of underdetermination, otherwise known as the underdetermination of hypothesis by evidence. It's a really interesting problem, issue in the philosophy of science, and it concerns, ultimately, the rationality of scientific practice. We're really interested in the question, how do we rationally decide between competing theories? Why do we pick one over the other? What rational considerations lead us to think that one is more rational, a more rational hypothesis than another? So suppose, as is common in science, that we're considering two incompatible hypotheses, H1 and H2. When we say that H1 and H2 are incompatible, we mean that they both can't be true at the same time. So either H1 is true or H2 is true, perhaps neither is true, but they both can't be true at the same time. So how do we decide which one is rational to believe or accept? We're considering both of these. Well. A natural answer is to say the evidence determines which one is rational to believe. If we're interested in truth and evidence gets us to the truth, then we should follow the evidence where it leads. So perhaps the evidence will tell us that H1 is more plausible than H2. In that case, we should pick H1 over H2. So for example, imagine that O is your evidence. And if you recall from a few lectures before, we talked about an easy method for confirmation, uh, otherwise known as the hypothetical deductive method of confirmation. And in, in this example, I'm using that method. So suppose that H1 predicts O, and it turns out that O is the case. So H1 is confirmed by O. But you can imagine that H2 does not predict O. Perhaps it predicts the very opposite. So in that case, O disconfirms H2, so not H2. So in this case, it's rational to believe H1 over H2. Why? Because H1 predicts your observational data, while H2 does not. So all else being equal, um, it's rational to pick H1 over H2. But what about cases where H1 and H2 entail the same observational data. This is where the problem of underdetermination comes in. So in this sort of case, H1 and H2 are empirically equivalent. So I'm understanding empirical, empirical equivalence to mean that two incompatible hypotheses, or more than two incompatible hypotheses, make the same observational predictions. So H1 predicts that O, but so does H2. They both tell us that we should find the world or a, a situation to be a certain way. So O is entailed by H1 and H2, both of which can't be true at the same time. Remember, H1 and H2 are incompatible. So which one do we pick? Um, unfortunately, the evidence doesn't seem to determine this for us. As an example, consider an experiment that was conducted on rats. Um, some scientists wanted to de determine whether uh, the complexity of an environment impacted the brain development of rats. So they had you know, one group of rats living in a very simple environment with just a feeding tube and no toys, no like hamster wheel, or in this case a rat wheel. Whereas the other group of rats lived in a very enriched environment. There were toys and tunnels and um, mazes and the rat wheel and so on. And the study found that the rats living in the second environment had more developed brains than the rats living in the first environment. <clears throat> so the explanation was that the complexity of an environment impacts the development of one's brain. However, an empirically equivalent hypothesis was put forth. And it went like this. Well, the reason that the brains of the rats in the second group were more developed was because the scientists doing the experiment were handling the rats. In order to clean the cage, because the cage had so many things in it, they had to grab the rats and take them out and put them in a holding container until the, their cage was clean. And so 
the touch that was involved here had a positive impact on their brain development. So we can construe these two hypotheses as being incompatible. The first hypothesis is that it's the environment alone that determines the complexity of the brain. Whereas the alternative hypothesis says that it's not the environment, rather it's touch, it's being handled by other creatures that determines brain development. So these are incompatible hypotheses and they're empirically equivalent. They predict the same observational data. In both cases, you're going to have rats with more developed brains. In the first case, you think it's because the environment is more enriched. In the second case, you think it's because of the touch that was involved. So the question is, how do we decide which of these hypotheses is more rational to believe? Which one's more likely to be true? It doesn't seem like the evidence we have can help us make that decision. It underdetermines the right answer, or it underdetermines the hypothesis that is more rational. We might need to do further experiments or appeal to some other considerations, but the evidence itself doesn't help us make that decision. We can think of other examples, some that are rather silly, but which illustrate the point very nicely. So for example, imagine you walk into your kitchen and you see paw prints across the kitchen floor and it looks like, it looks like muddy paw prints and you follow them to the living room where your dog is cowering in the corner and he's covered in mud. So you infer that your dog was rolling around in mud and then walked through the kitchen. And that's why the paw prints are there and that's why he's all muddy. But there's an alternative explanation and it's empirically equivalent with the first one. It's this, one of your friends is trying to play a cruel joke on you and he's trying to frame the dog. So he throws a bucket of mud on your dog when you're not in the house, puts the dog in the living room, and then using some sort of contraption, he makes paw prints, puts paw prints across the kitchen floor. And it looks just like it would if your dog had actually walked through the kitchen floor after rolling around in mud. So there's another case of empirically equivalent hypotheses, and it illustrates the problem of underdetermination. So one way of stating the problem goes as follows, and this is called by Larry Loudon, the Humean underdetermination problem. For any finite body of evidence, there are indefinitely many mutually contrary theories, each of which logically entails that evidence. So the question is, does this mean that no finite body of observational evidence could ever make it rational to believe one hypothesis over another? If there are an indefinite number of mutually contrary theories which logically entail the evidence we have, then how do we determine which of these hypotheses is right? Again, it seems like the evidence itself doesn't help us out here. So this is one version of the problem of underdetermination. Um, in the Loudon reading, you'll find an alternative version. And the one we're considering here is supposed to create a problem for the rationality of scientific practice. After all, we want the evidence to direct us. But if it's true that there are a whole bunch of incompatible theories that entail the evidence we have, then how can we use that evidence to decide among them, to make a decision about which one we're going to believe or which one we're going to rationally accept. So before closing, let me just say a word about how we might respond to the problem of underdetermination. And you can find some of this in the Loudon reading. So it's important to note that evidence can stand in different relations to a hypothesis. For example, the hypothesis might entail the evidence or alternatively, the, the hypothesis might be the best explanation for the evidence. We're going to learn all about explanatory reasoning, but the key thing to know now is that H doesn't have to entail E in order for H to be the best explanation for E. This is really important. 
So entailment is not the only evidential relation. H1 and H2 might both entail E, but H1 might be a better explanation for E than H2. And if you think explanatory reasoning can get us to the truth, or if you think it's a rational procedure for hypothesis evaluation, then you can choose or pick H, uh, H1 over H2, and that would be a rational way to proceed. Like I said, later in the class we'll be learning more about inference to the best explanation and what makes one explanation better than another. Lastly, even if both H1 and H2 entail E, H might be a less complex hypothesis than H2, so maybe we can rationally decide between empirically equivalent hypotheses by considering the intrinsic nature of the hypotheses themselves. One hypothesis might have a higher prior probability than the other, um, or be less complex than the other, and so be more likely to be true. Uh, we can talk more about this in class. Anyway, the problem of underdetermination is really interesting, and I look forward to discussing it further with you in class. See ya!